So I'm going to invite Kayla to come on up and read for us. We're going to be in Esther chapter 9. We're going to be reading the first 10 verses so you can stand with us. Uh, you can turn there. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in that seat right in front of you. You can pull from there. And let's read together. Kayla. This is Esther chapter 9, verses 1 through 10 in the ESV. Now, in the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar, on the thirteenth day of the same, when the king's command and edict were about to be carried out, on the very day when the enemies of the Jews hoped to gain the mastery over them, the reverse occurred. The Jews gained mastery over those who hated them. The Jews gathered in their cities throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus to lay hands on those who sought their harm. And no one could stand against them, for the fear had fallen for the fear of them had fallen on all the peoples. All the officials of the province and the satraps and the governors of the royal agents also helped the Jews, for the fear of Mordecai had fallen on them. For Mordecai was great in the king's house, and his fame spread throughout all the provinces, for the man Mordecai grew more and more powerful. The Jews struck their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying them, and did as they pleased to those who hated them. In Susa, the citadel itself, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men, and also, and also killed Parshandatha, and Dalphon, and Aspatha, and Paratha, and Adelia, and Eridatha, and Parmashta, and Erisai, and Eridai, and Vizatha, the ten sons of Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews. But they laid no hand on the plunder. You may be seated. Both services have got hand claps for that one because I said that's what we call the nightmare passage for anybody to read through all those names. It's like, how am I possibly going to do that? Well, we, we find ourselves at the end of Esther. We've got one more week uh, next week that we'll be, we'll be concluding, but, but we find ourselves near the tail end. A lot of the action has already transpired, uh, but this is a pivotal moment where we've seen two edicts. One edict that was meant for the annihilation and the destruction of the Jews had gone out. Now another edict has gone out uh, and saying that the Jews can defend themselves against anyone who would come after them, and we, we find ourselves in just this moment. And really, what we're going to see throughout this passage, what we've seen throughout this book, is this great reversal that occurs. This surprise of one expectation was had, and then suddenly we see a very different outcome. Uh, a good friend of mine was telling me a story of that when he was a kid, uh, his sister thought that she would play this great trick on him. And so he, she knew that he loved ice cream, and so she made him this big, heaping bowl of ice cream. Uh, but actually, it was just pure butter. Um, but she had scooped it to make it look like ice cream. Um, and what I love about the story is that my friend also says, you know, you put anything in front of me as a kid and I was going to consume it. And so the great reversal in this moment was his sister was waiting as he took that first bite and he bit into it and he let the spoon go, taking the full bite and like savoring it all in his mouth. And she's like ready to start laughing. And he's like, this is the best ice cream I've ever had. Right? <laughs> and he finished the bowl because he just was committed, right? Sometimes we have an expectation of what's going to happen and something different plays out. And where we find ourselves in this story is, is, is that moment. Because as we look at what's been transpiring 11 months b before, a decree had gone out declaring the destructions of the Jews. And now this day had finally come, which means that Jewish families had gathered together in their neighborhoods. They were anxiously watching their neighbors. Who was going to act? Who was actually going to step forward uh, to bring destruction to them? Would, would the attack come? Now, in the back of their head, as they were wondering if they had to really prepare for battle, they were like, the edict of Mordecai and Esther's gone out, saying that we can defend themselves. Was that enough of a deterrent to keep people from actually pursuing us? And so we just imagine, huddled in their homes, the hushed tones of, of nervous voices filling the air. 
Mothers grabbing hold of their kids and and forming a wall in front of them, huddling them back in the back rooms, hoping that they don't have to witness any of the carnage that may come. Trying to hush their babies that they don't make too much noise. Boys talking to their fathers saying, I'm old enough to fight too. Give me a sword and I'll join with you. While the fathers begin to feel the weight of the uncertainty of never having to go to battle before. And now here they are holding a sword in defense of their family. And so throughout the Persian Empire, we see Jewish people banding together, preparing to defend themselves. You can almost hear their hearts pounding in their ears. And as they're listening, going, is that just my heart or is that footsteps? Are people coming? Has the time come? And they realize, yes, that is the scuffle of footsteps coming our way. There are people on their way now to bring destruction to us. And the time for us to arise has come. This is the space we find ourselves at the beginning of chapter 9. In the 12th month, it says in verse 1, which is the month of Adar on the 13th day of the same, when the king's command and edict were about to be carried out on the very day when the enemies of the Jews hoped to gain mastery over them, the reverse occurred. The Jews gained mastery over those who hated them. A day that was meant for death the annihilation, that the Jews were to be killed, destroyed, annihilated, wiped out, a day that would steal, still deal death, but not as it originally intended. See, the words here say that the reverse occurred, that the, the Jews' enemies had hoped to gain mastery over them, but instead the very reverse occurred. If you're reading in the NIV translation, it actually will say the tables turned. This word reverse carries with it a variety of meanings. It means to turn over, to bring destruction, to change, to turn around. This is where we find ourselves, to demolish. All the expectations of what was to happen in this moment have been crushed in the best of ways. Again, a day where the enemies of the Jews had hoped to to gain the upper hand, to have mastery over them, uh, would be the day instead where the Jews would be the victors. And all those who hated them would not stand a chance against them. Now, this is important because as we step into a passage like this, it's easy for us to stand removed and be like, what does this kind of battle, what does this kind of violence have to do with us today? Why are we paying attention to this? And one of the words in there that I think is helpful for us us to hang on to is it says that they were able to to take on and no one could stand against them, all those who hated them. See, this is intentional and it's, it's reminding us of the intent of Mordecai's decree that we looked at last week. The Jews were to defend themselves against those who were their enemies. They weren't just to go around attacking anyone, but only those who intended them harm, only those that stood as their enemies, only those who would provoke them. And so verse 2, we read, the Jews gathered in the cities throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus to lay hands on those who sought them, their harm, and no one could stand against them, for the fear of them had fallen on all the peoples. And all the officials of the provinces and the satraps and the governors and the royal agents also helped the Jews, for the fear of Mordecai had fallen on them. For Mordecai was great in the king's house, and his fame spread throughout all the provinces. From the man, Mordecai grew more and more powerful. Banding together throughout all the provinces, we see the Jewish people coming together. This decree had not scattered the Jews or isolated them as it had intended to do. Instead, it it united them. And what we see in this, this gathering, we're told that no one could stand against them. No one stood a chance. And why? Because the fear of them had fallen on all the people. Now, in Scripture, we see the word fear used often in, in Old Testament and New Testament throughout Scripture. We also hear at times that uh, we are to fear the Lord. Proverbs 1.7 reminds us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the word here for this kind of fear is yirah. And it means an awe or a reverence. It's an acknowledgement of awesomeness. 
that when we acknowledge who God is, we, we have just like open mouth awe that he is so incredible, so gracious, so majestic, so wonderful, but also we, we fear because he is so holy other. Prophets of the Old Testament would fall to the ground in fear whenever they encountered a vision of the Lord because their fear of the Lord was so great. But the word here that we see in this verse, the fear that had uh, gripped all the people because of the Jews is a different word. It's not yira, it's pahad, a word that means to dread, to have a fearful anticipation. It's the fear of that test that you have not studied for that suddenly you're sharpening your pencil for, right? It's that feeling when you get that cryptic email from your boss, we need to talk. It's that feeling of that project that is just lingering over you that you know needs to get done. The people of Persia were filled with a dread of the Jewish people of what exactly were they capable of, what exactly was going to be carried out against them. And we see that this fear of the people, it actually gets raised up to Mordecai himself, that he was uniquely set apart in some ways. And this fear of Mordecai was so great that we see that all the officials of the provinces, the satraps, the governors, all the royal agents, they begin to help the Jewish people because they were living in fear of Mordecai. And why were they in fear of Mordecai? Because the last regime under Haman had been completely overthrown by him. And if Haman, who was second in command of all the kingdom, couldn't stand against Mordecai, who were they? And so they saw this shift of power. And as we see even today within our own uh, world leadership and within our own politics, when the shift of power happens, you see people just jump ship to those that have the perceived power. And so in this moment, that's what began to happen. They're like, Mordecai is the man. We're not messing with him. We're going to help his people and hopefully get on his good side. But there's also something else at work here. And this is what I love about scripture is that when you read through it, there's echoes of other scriptures throughout it that ties it all together as one unified narrative. See, the way in which Mordecai is being talked about here, as the original readers were hearing this account, they would have felt kind of their spider senses going up, like, oh, this takes me back to another passage. It takes me back to Exodus 11.3, in which the, the scriptures are talking about Moses. It says, and the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants, and in the sight of the people. Moses grew in stature because he stood as mediator between Pharaoh and God's people. Now we see Mordecai is being put in that same position as mediator between God's people and Haman and his edict. And he's being compared as this, this new Moses in some ways stepping into a similar role in place. And that's why we read in verse 4 that Mordecai was great in the king's house. His fame spread throughout all the provinces for the man Mordecai grew more and more powerful. Again, without ever mentioning the name of God, we see God at work. Without explicitly naming his movements, we see once again the people of God are rescued by the mighty hand of God at just the right moment, at just the right time, and just the right way. Just as God had shown up for the Hebrew slaves and freed them from the exodus here again when a decree of death had been issued out, he's shown up once again providing somebody to step into the gap. And so verse 5 continues saying, the Jews struck all their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying them. And they did as they pleased to those who hated them. Again, the Jews are, are triumphant in their defense they could do as they pleased, but against who? Who does it call out? Those who hated them. Those who still stood in opposition to them. So you have to remember, the people that are standing in opposition to the Jews at this point, they had heard both edicts. They had seen the demise of Haman, and still they chose to go against the Jewish people. They still chose to try to kill, destroy, and annihilate the Jewish people. They said, oh, we have to choose a side. We're going to take our chances and go against the Jewish people. And so we read that the result of this in verse 6 
In Susa, the citadel itself, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men and also killed Parshandatha and Alphon and Espatha and Porantha and Adelia and Eridatha and Parmashta and Erisai and Eridai and Vizatha, the ten sons of Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews, but they laid no hand on the plunder. I figured if I was going to make Kayla read it, I should have to read it too. <laughs> That's only fair. That's only fair. Now, in this section, a few things to take note of. Okay, the first one is this. We see here that 500 men are killed. 500 men, okay? Just pay attention to that. We're going to come back to it. The other thing is that we read the 10 names uh, of the, the sons of Hamadatha. The sons of Hamadatha, they're specifically drawn out, lined out, okay? And we're going to pay attention to that. And then finally, there's a phrase that's used here for the first time, but it's going to be used three times throughout this passage, three times drawing our attention to something within it. And it's this phrase, but they laid no hand on the plunder. We want to pay attention to that. So let's start first uh, with this idea of 500 men being killed in uh, Susa, the citadel, the, the capital of the Persian Empire, so to speak. We're not sure how many people were within the, the confines of the capital itself. We know that the king's palace courtyard, uh, all of that was, was there. there. There would have been a, a number of people there, but we don't know how big it was, what we have some estimates around is that in the entire Persian Empire, there is between 17 and 35 million people. So it's a vast empire. Of that 17 to 35 million people, which I know is a pretty big span, uh, 750,000 of those are estimated to be Jewish people. So you see, it's, it's a really small minority of this population. But within the capital itself, we see that 500 men, and this isn't surprising that there would have been 500 people still loyal to Haman, 500 people that would have still been uh, going after the Jewish people, probably alongside his sons that were ready to take up their father's cause and avenge his death. That 500 men, okay, it's drawn out here that it's, it's men. We just get the number of, of men. Now, they had full reign to defend themselves. In Mordecai's edict, they had full reign to kill, destroy, annihilate any would-be attackers, even women and children, and that they were free to take plunder. But what we see in this is just a number of men that are killed in this moment. The second thing that I want us to pay attention to, Haman's 10 sons are killed. This wouldn't be surprising. This, this would be uh, an intentional in some ways. They, they would have been looking for them. They would not have been surprised that Haman's sons would be coming after them uh, because they would have been seeking to avenge uh, their father, but also they would be seen as a continued threat. They'd be seen as carrying on the lineage of the Amalekites, of, of Haman. And, and so to, to destroy them would be seen as something that was necessary to do. Now, within this list, there's a few unique observations and some traditions that have arisen uh, from the names given here of Haman's sons. The first is that in the Hebrew text, in the scrolls themselves, as they were handwritten out, we see that the names of Haman's sons are set apart in column form. I'm going to show you a picture because it's hard to describe. And just, just because I know someone's going to ask, you're going to be like, but that list has 11 the top 10 are the names. Uh, the subscript at the bottom is just speaking to kind of a transitory statement. So just in case, you know, some of you out there who are just like, I'm not so sure about what you're saying right now. Um, I got one of those questions after first service. And I was going to say something really snarky, but they were right to ask me. It was a great question. Because we should pay attention to those things, right? Whenever I'm throwing something up there, I hope you're paying attention to it. So it lists them out. Now, why is it listed out like that? We don't have a, a full reason other than that some see this as the scribe's way of hanging out the sons, listing them out, drawing attention to that all 10 of them were, were taken care of. All 10 of them were delineated and destroyed in this moment. Now, the other thing uh, that's interesting with Haman's sons is that their names are derived uh, from what is called diva names. Now, if you're hearing that phrase and you're like, I don't know what a diva name is, I didn't either. 
uh, fascinating. Daiva names were once used of various gods in early Iranian and Hindu writings. And they later became associated with demonic powers in Eastern religions. Okay, so these names, yes, they were the lineage of Haman, but they also carried with them the weight of being uh, attached to Eastern uh, demonic gods. Again, we see the Hebrew people are conquering not only their physical enemies, but also their spiritual enemies. That God was doing a far greater work than we can ever uh, imagine. Again, we're, we're seeing the unseen. As I was reading this, I was also caught by all the illusions that take us back to the Exodus. And these 10 sons that are destroyed, representing 10 demonic forces, uh, they remind me much of the 10 plagues that God sent and unleashed on the, the Egyptian people. And those 10 plagues, each one of them was used to show God's superiority over the pagan Egyptian gods of the land. So again, we see this movement of God that when he shows up to rescue us, he doesn't just rescue us from the immediate, he rescues us from the physical and also the the spiritual. And so we're seeing God as sovereign and supreme once again. And finally, there's one tradition uh, I've I've shared with you that in in the celebration of the Feast of Purim, in which we read through all of Esther, and there's there's moments where you boo when Haman comes out, and it's this really fun celebration. There's another tradition that arose in later uh, rabbinical circles, and it became the practice that when you got to these 10 names of the 10 sons, that you were to read them all in one breath. Now, you've heard those names read twice now, and you know that's not easy, but the point of it was that you wanted to give as little space to the lineage of Haman as you could. It was just another way in which you were acknowledging that they mean nothing because God has overcome and he has rescued his people. So we see that uh, the men who hated the Jews are defeated. We see the sons of Haman are destroyed. And then the final thing of note is that they took no plunder. Again, we're going to see this phrase pop up two more times as we continue reading on. But what does this remind us of? What is this, a nice little hyperlink that takes us back and reminds us of where we've already been? Remember when we talked around the lineage of Mordecai. We talked around the lineage of Haman. Mordecai came from the tribe of Benjamin, and he connects us to King Saul, the first king of the Israelite people. Haman was an Agagite. His heritage went back to King Agag, an Amalekite, and he connects us with the Amalekites, the sworn enemies of the Jewish people. And why were they the sworn enemies of the Jewish people? I know we covered some of this already before, but just to refresh you, when the people of God were coming out of Egypt and they were wandering through the desert. It was the Amalekites that were were attacking them. But how did they attack them? Did they take them head on? No. They took out their stragglers. They took out their weak. They took out their wounded. And God did not forget this. God was so furious, and God, who is a God of justice, said, I will utterly destroy them. And so centuries later, King Saul is tasked with just that job. I want you to go and I want you to annihilate the Amalekites for they are evil in my sight. And God gives him the decree that you are to go and you are to destroy them. Men, women, children, I want them gone. But you take no plunder. You take nothing from them. Well, King Saul, remember what he does. He goes and he spares King Agag and he takes plunder. Right? It's like the very things that he's not to do, he does. And the prophet Samuel shows up and he's like, Saul, what have you done? You were, you were tasked with one thing and you, you didn't do it. You did the very opposite of what you were supposed to do. And Saul in that moment tries to justify his actions saying, well, I saved the best so that we could sacrifice it to God and I was going to worship to him. And Samuel the prophet just looked at him and said, ah, to obey is better than sacrifice. To listen to the voice of God above any other is better than anything, Saul. Because of that, you're now rejected as king. You know, change the course of everything. And what do we see transpiring in this moment? That they are defending themselves, but they are destroying the lineage of Haman, the Agagite, the Amalekite. 
but they are not taking any plunder. They are not taking anything for themselves. They are finishing what Saul should have done centuries earlier. They are acting in obedience to God. They have defeated their enemies, their ancient foe. They don't need any more than that. And so they take no plunder. Verse 11, we read on. That very day, the number of those killed in Susa, in Susa the citadel was reported to the king. And the king said to Queen Esther in Susa, the citadel of the Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men and also the 10 sons of Haman. What then have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now what is your wish? It shall be granted you. And what further is your request? It shall be fulfilled. Now King Ahasuerus continues to be one of the strangest characters in this story. Because if you just think for a moment what he is witnessing, he is king. And all those who are in his own kingdom are waging war with one another. And his reaction in this moment, as he has sanctioned both dueling edicts, he can't believe how successful the Jews have been. It's almost like in this conversation, he's like, Esther, look at your people go. I can't believe this. This is great. There's also a little undertone of like, I mean, what more could you possibly want? This is like so good. But whatever you want, it's yours. Now, we've seen the king do this before. We see him do this all the time with Esther in particular. What do you want? Up to half my kingdom. I think by this point, he's learned that Esther is far smarter than he thinks she is. And so he does not offer her half his kingdom because she might have taken him up at this point. You know, He's just like, what, what, what do you want? What do you want? It's yours to be fulfilled. Take whatever you want. And so, you may think in this moment, Esther's got all that she's wanted. She's seen the salvation of her people. The, the enemy has been put to death. The enemy's sons have been put to death. But what I find so surprising in this moment is Esther asks for more. Verse 13 and Esther said, if it please the king, let the Jews who are in Susa be allowed tomorrow also to do according to this day's edict. And let the ten sons of Haman be hanged on the gallows. Esther asks for one more day. She says, give me one more day. Give me one more day in the capital to purge the hate and let me make a statement. She wants no enemy left and she wants to make a statement with the sons of Haman. And what is she asking for? Remember when it's saying that she wants them hung on the gallows, what it really is saying in the Persian Empire, she wants them uh, just raised and displayed on a stake. That their bodies would be displayed for all of their enemies. Again, we hear this and we're, we're kind of horrified. We flinch a little bit when we think of what's being asked for here. But in biblical times, this was, this was common. To display the bodies of the enemies was, was a used tactic. One, to build the morale of your people and say, look what we have done, look who we have conquered, but also as a deterrent to any kingdom that would come towards you. King Saul, when he died on the battlefield, his body was taken up and it was placed on the wall of Beth Shean, a, a neighboring, a rival kingdom that wanted to show their prominence. They took some of his son body, son's bodies and did the same thing to show that they had overcome. And so we read this and we imagine it and we don't want to imagine it. We don't want those images because it seems harsh. It seems unnecessary. And honestly, it seems a little out of character with what we've seen of Esther up to this point. And just to, to make it all the more fun, the author of Esther has this brilliant way of not leaning one way or the other. Gives us no indication as this is way too harsh or this is way too lenient. This was totally appropriate or this is the worst thing she could have done. Just kind of leaves the information there for us. And so whenever we come to a moment like this where we have these hard questions, we looked at this last week, uh, there's, a, there's a tendency to want to like clean it up a little bit or run some PR for God to be like, yeah, I think what you meant to do here. And so I don't want to gloss over any of this. But I, I think what's happening here and what I see in Esther 
is that she is taking no chances. She is not going to give one seed of hope to her enemies. She's not going to give one opportunity for her enemies to rise again. She's looking to destroy her enemy entirely. I mean, after all, Saul's sparing of Agag had allowed a new generation of evil to come forth, and she wants no part of that. And so let's just pull back from this story for just a moment, and let's go, okay, what what does this have to do with anything in our own lives? Well, is there some enemy? Is there some form of sin? an action, a habit, something destructive in your life that you are just allowing to linger, that you're just leaving the door open a little bit? Is there something that you are allowing to feed your pride, your lust, your gluttony, your greed? You know it's dangerous, but you leave it there. Something that you know needs to be put to death, but you can't quite kill it entirely. I think this is why Paul in Colossians 3, he reminds us, he says, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things of the earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desires, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Paul is reminding us in this moment to put to death those things that are not of God, to not give them a glimmer of hope. If you come in here and you tell me that I'm really committed, uh, I'm going to drop a certain amount of weight, and the the way that I'm going to do that is, you know, every day I'm just going to have lunch at the all-you-can-eat buffet at Sizzler, right? I'm going to be like, what are you doing? Why are you putting yourself in harm's way? In the same way, I'm working on cutting my credit card debt, and in order to do that, I think I just need to get a few more cards, and also there's a sale happening right now on Amazon, and I'm just going to order a couple things to help build my credit. Like, no, what are you doing? That's not going to work. I remember years ago, I was talking with a student when I was working with middle schoolers, and, and we're, we're about to get a little PG-13, Okay. I'm just letting you know that right now. Uh, And and he came in, and he's like, "Um, I got to talk to you about something. I was like, okay, what's going on? He's like, every day after school, I have this this pattern. I go to the library. I'm like, great. He's like, and I I go there to study. He's like, the problem is, is every time I go into study in the library, I end up over, I end up over in this, like, section where there's some picture books. And that's, like, kind of all he said. Like, and I'm like, Yes. He's like, and I, and I end up just staying over there and looking at images I know I shouldn't be looking at. I said, okay. I said, well, what if, what if you, know, you show up at the library and you, just, you go directly to the tables where you're going to study, where you're sitting with other people that are around you, and, and we're like building this plan out. He's like, okay, okay. Flash forward like two months. He's like, oh, every time I go to the library, I end up in the same spot. So what's the, what's the solution to that? Don't go to the library, right? Which sounds really funny to a kid who's trying to study, to be like, don't go to the library. But that was the conversation we had. I'm like, quit going to the library. He's like, well, what do you mean? I said, it's not working. You can't do it, okay? You can't do it. Just don't go to the library. Because every time you go to the library, you know why you're going to the library. So quit going to the library, right? And the thing that I know is that we all have a library of some sort that we keep going to thinking we're going to overcome, we're going to get this, we're going to, no, we need to be ruthless and put some of those things to death in our life. Christ came that we could be renewed in his image. And for whatever reason, sometimes we just like to leave that door cracked open as though there's something there for us. And there's not, there's only death. 
And so in this moment, as harsh as it is, I see Esther looking out going, I'm not going to give any opportunity for this enemy to rise again, for this enemy to come against my people. And so give us one more day, king. Give us one more day. Let me hang those sons so that everyone can see and be afraid of what, what can be accomplished. Give me one more day that anyone comes against us that we get to go against them. And how does the king respond to Esther's request? As he always does. So the king commanded this to be done. And a decree was issued in Susa, and the ten sons of Haman were hanged. The Jews who were in Susa gathered also on the 14th day of the month of Adar, and they killed 300 men in Susa, but they laid no hands on the plunder. So the sons of Haman on display for all to see. The lineage of the Amalekites finally dealt with. 300 more men are killed. And still, they laid no hands on their plunder. It's not the point of this. It's not the point of what they're doing. Verse 16, now the rest of the Jews who were in the king's provinces also gathered to defend their lives and got relief from their enemies and killed 75,000 of those who hated them. But they laid no hands on the plunder. Throughout the land, success is had by the Jews. We read that number, 75,000 people who stood in opposition and hatred to the Jews were killed. Now, we can read that in light of, well, if there's like 17 to 35 million, that's a small fraction of those who are in the population of the Persian Empire. But tell that to the families that were missing those in their lives. 75,000, that's, that's a lot of death. And what do we see? That sin, hatred, always leads to death. 75,000 lose their lives in this moment. And they want no part of their goods. No plunders taken. But what do we see in this moment? A decree that was meant to annihilate the entirety of the Jewish people. We see again a great reversal in their actions. And a fulfillment of what their, their king was to do. King Saul, now they do. But none of this would have been possible. None of this would have been managed in any way, shape, or form without the silent hand of God working a miraculous reversal. An edict of death, now a moment of life for God's people. And so verse 17, we pick back up, reading down to 19. This was on the 13th day of the month of Adar. And on the 14th day, they rested and made that a day of feasting and gladness. But the Jews who were in Susa gathered on the 13th day and on the 14th day and rested on the 15th day, making that day of feasting and gladness. Therefore, the Jews of the villages who live in the rural towns hold the 14th day of the month of Adar as a day for gladness and feasting as a holiday and as a day on which they send gifts of food to one another. What's the result of this great reversal in this moment? It's rest. Noah, rest from their enemies. Rest from their fear. Their fasting, it's been turned into feasting. Fear has turned to rest. Sorrow has now turned into celebration. But this idea of rest carries with it the idea to stop and dwell in peace. Now, as we come near the end of Esther here, next week we're going to look at uh, how this whole story becomes memorialized and remembered and celebrated, celebrated throughout the, the festival of Purim. That's celebrated even still today. But today we're going to stop and just look at what we read and see that the people of God, who had been scattered throughout a foreign land, they'd been seemingly forgotten, seemingly alone, outnumbered, left to the whims of dangerous leadership and people who did not honor God. All the odds were against them. And then, through a series of events, a great reversal takes place, and suddenly we see the unseen. The enemy is defeated, and the people of God rest feast, and celebrate. Rest. Again, it's an idea that always seems out of reach to us, doesn't it? 
How many times have we said, I just got to make it through this week and then I, can, then I can take some rest, right? Only to get to the end of your week and be like, no, I think maybe next week. If I get to the end of next week and the week after that, well, the holidays are coming up and that, well, let's just be honest. So maybe in 2023, well, 2024 might be a better chance of getting some rest. Right? It's this illusion of rest, but this longing for rest, And this idea of rest is one that we see in the very beginnings of Scripture, that God creates all things, and then he shabbats, he stops, he rests. God rests. And why did he rest? To set a pattern for us that we should be a people that stop and rest. When Joshua was speaking to the Israelites, and he was reminding them of what they fought for. In Joshua 1.13, we, we read this. Remember the word that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God is providing you a place of rest and will give you this land. There's always this idea of finding rest in the promise of God. Even uh, the Lord was said to rest in the tabernacle, to dwell there, that he was to rest in the temple. It's where he would dwell, his presence would be. Ultimately, he would rest in Jesus, the very flesh, the incarnate Christ coming to earth, dwelling among us that we might know him and follow him, that he might rescue and redeem us. But then even in his going away and his resurrection, he sends us the spirit who now resides and rests in us so that we can have peace and wholeness. But much like the people of Esther's day, we, we feel the sense of the enemy all around us. For some of you, that may feel like a a physical enemy in words and deeds. Others of you, it might feel like a spiritual one in soul and spirit. And Paul reminds us in Ephesians 6, 12, he says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. We long for rest. It's written within us. We long for rest from our enemies. We long for rest from our our sins. And what we need is a great reversal in our own lives. Because rest is truly an act of rebellion in our world. And not in the sense that we, we rest or we abandon work. No, it's an act of a rebellion in that we rest in the work of God, meaning we find peace in the midst of chaos because we rest, we trust, we place our faith in the work of Christ in the providence and the sovereignty of God. Jesus is the one who invites us to rest in him because he has done for us what we could never do on our own. but we allow our enemies just to to linger. We allow our enemies to stir up the waters of our soul. We allow our present problems to rob us of peace. We allow our fears to keep us blind to the unseen movements of God. But what this account of Esther is reminding us is to continually rest in the work of God. Even when we cannot see the end of our story, we trust and we rest in him because he will hold you fast. And when we recognize what we are invited into, when we see that it's not a matter of of simply trying harder, but it's a matter of, of choosing Jesus, We find rest. If it's between going to the library or choosing Jesus, we choose Jesus. And in him we find rest. We are a people who can feast even in the presence of our enemies. And we are a people who celebrate the ways in which we see the hand of God move. But the question remains, can you find rest in God? Or are you too busy trying to fix everything yourself? Again, the Sabbath was this gift that God gave us to remind us 
to help us practice of resting in him. It was a a taste uh, to practice our faith that if we stop, we remember God doesn't. That in our inaction, he is still active. And when we don't produce something, we still have value. We haven't lost ourselves because our identity is not in what we do. It's found in him. And so if we find our rest in him, we can be at peace wherever we are. A decree of death ended in a moment of life and rest. In Jesus, we see the instrument of death and the cross has become a symbol of life and rest. Life, because in Jesus we find our death has been paid in full. Our debt has been paid in full. Rest. Because in Christ, our enemy has been defeated. And by trusting in Jesus and resting in him, we find rest for our weary and troubled soul. You pray with me. Father, as we pause in these moments to respond to you, to hear from you, to listen to what you would speak to us as you've been speaking to us? Would you help us to pay attention to those areas of our lives where we are not trusting you, where maybe we are leaving the the door open in ways that we know are, are not what you want for us? Would you give us strength to choose you? Father, where we're placing our faith in things beside you, where we are feeling anxious, where we are feeling troubled, where we are feeling weary, God, would we bring these to you as you remind us to come to you and find rest. Father, where where Esther sought to free her people from their enemy, What she did in part, you have done in full. You have accomplished once and for all the defeat of our enemy, of sin and of death. You have overcome on our behalf that in you we may have life. And for anyone in here who is just barely hanging on, Father, would they know that with whatever strength they have, hanging on to you provides all the strength they need. So would we find rest and peace as we dwell with you? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, would those words continue to just overwhelm us of how great you are, how awesome you are, how wonderful you are, how worthy of our worship you are. So God, would we keep our eyes fixed on you and the hope that is found in you. Remind us that in you there is life. We love you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we close this morning, um, I want to remind you, if you're interested in hearing more about what's going on in India and how you can come on that trip, Aaron's right in the back. Aaron, you just can give a little wave so people know where to go and find you. He's just right there. It's easy for us to come into this place and to walk out thinking, there's more I need to do. I need to try harder. I, I need to be better. But remember the words of Jesus that invite us to rest. What does he say? Get perfect and then talk to me. No. He says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. May we rest in him this week, and may you experience the goodness of his grace, and may you know his peace. God bless you. We'll see you next week.